Well, hello and welcome to another lesson from God's Word. I'm glad that you could join me once again. And we're going to be looking at Psalm 13 today. If you'd like to take your Bibles and turn there to the 13th Psalm, Psalm of David. And I'll be reading from the NIV today. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. My enemy will say I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, for he has been good to me. A 16th century mystic wrote a poem about the extreme difficulties of life when nothing seems to make any sense. And he entitled his poem, The Dark Night of the Soul. In February of 1862, President Abraham Lincoln endured one of many dark nights of the soul when the circumstances of his life brought unbearable pain and despair and disillusionment. His son Willie had recently died and now his son Tad was seriously ill and it wasn't, uh, wasn't apparent that he was going to survive. And a nurse was attending the sick child and she recalled how the president would pace back and forth at the foot of his bed and say over and over again, this is the hardest trial of my life. Why is this happening? Why, why, why? You know, sooner or later, we all find ourselves in the midst of circumstances that bring unbearable pain and despair and sometimes even disillusionment. It's just part of living in a fallen world. And I'm talking about the death of a loved one or divorce or a serious illness or a financial crisis or a problem in your family. Any number of things can bring about a dark night of the soul. And in times of pain and confusion and uncertainty, like King David and President Lincoln, we sometimes cry out, why? We cry out, how long? Where are you, God? Do you hear me? Don't you care? Psalm 13 is called a psalm of lament. And the fact is, psalms of lament tend to make some Christian people a little uncomfortable. And by that I mean these psalms say things that we're not even sure we're supposed to say out loud. They ask pointed questions of God. They even express feelings of confusion and doubt about what God is doing or failing to do. And that sometimes makes people a little uncomfortable. But rather than think about it this way, Psalm 13, as well as the other Psalms of Lament, are all part of the inspired word of Almighty God. They've been placed in the Bible deliberately by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. And so you know what that means? That means that we have divine permission to lament. And by the way, the word lament means to mourn, howl, or grieve in anguish. And before we look specifically at Psalm 13, maybe you ought to just notice a few other Psalms of lament, and there are several. And let me just give you just a little bit of a sample. Psalm 10 is a psalm of lament. And it begins by saying, Why, why, O Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Have there ever been times in your life when it seemed like God was hiding from you? In Psalm 22, David cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do those words sound familiar? They should, because those same words were also uttered by Jesus on the cross. 
And in that same psalm, David goes on to say, Why are you so far from saving me? Oh my God, I cry out, but you do not answer. Have you ever entertained those thoughts yourself? God, are you, are you hearing me? Why don't you answer? And in Psalm 88, is probably one of the bleakest. It says, I cry to you for help, O Lord. Why, O Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? Again, these and, and many more are psalms of lament. And, you know, as we're reading through the psalms, we may be tempted to just skip over them. We may be tempted just, just to move on to the psalms of rejoicing, you know, the, the psalms of praise, the, the psalms where so many of our hymns have found their inspiration. But brethren, listen to me, that's a mistake. Because again, they're put here for a reason. And the reason is for our blessing and for our benefit and for our consideration. God placed these psalms in his Bible on purpose for us to read. And, and I, I think there's a feeling among some that lamenting to God is a sign of weak faith, you know. You know, if you had a strong enough faith, then you wouldn't be complaining. You wouldn't be lamenting to God. Some feel that good Christians don't complain, and they certainly don't question or doubt. Good Christians, you know, strong, committed Christians can handle just about anything. They're never down. They're never depressed. They never doubt. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, if we're honest, we know better than that, don't we? Abraham, Job, Jeremiah, Elijah, David, John the Baptist, and even Jesus Christ himself all experienced their own personal dark nights of the soul. Times when they lamented and cried out to God in confusion and pain or even despair. Listen, in a world where there is so much hurt, and so much pain. We need to be able to express our feelings and be honest with God. We need to be able to ask God difficult questions and express ourselves because it's healthier for us to pour those things out, to pour out our pain. There's something therapeutic about it. And besides, God, know, God knows what you're feeling anyway, doesn't he? God already knows what you're thinking. God already knows your questions. So why not go ahead and voice them? And so with that being said, let's notice a few key verses in our text in Psalm 13. And then after we notice just a few key verses here, I'll point out a few things that hopefully can help you the next time you experience your own personal dark night of the soul. First of all, notice verse 1. David says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? David's complaint is that God is failed to act on his behalf, and he seems unwilling to even listen to his appeal for help. Now, let me ask you something. Do you think David knew better than that when he wrote those words? Do you think that David knew better to, than to really think that God would forget his own children? Of course. Sure. Sure. But understand, he's not expressing some doctrinal point here in Psalm 13. He's rather expressing a feeling. He's, he's expressing an emotion. God doesn't hide from us. But let's be honest, sometimes it feels like he does, doesn't it? That's what David is experiencing. And he's been praying and he's been crying out to God, but so far it doesn't seem like God is answering. And so in verse 2, he asks, how long must I wrestle with my thoughts? What does that mean? It means that since his situation, whatever it is, is not improving. I believe this psalm is written at a time that he was hiding from Saul with his men in that cave. And so since his situation is not improving, and since his questions and his prayers remain unanswered, that he's starting to wrestle with some disturbing thoughts. Sometimes unrelenting pain, whether it's physical or emotional, can cause us to wonder if maybe God has forgotten all about us. The heartaches and bitter disappointments of life can confuse us and, and cause us to call into question God's love and providential care. And then when the heartache doesn't go away, 
we become confused about the power and maybe even the goodness of God. And after a while, your mind begins to struggle with things, sort of plays tricks on you. I mean, the facts that you have in your head don't match up with the feelings that you have in your heart. Have you ever been there? And you start to wrestle with some hard questions like, is the Bible really true? Does God really care about me? Does prayer really work? Is all of this just a hoax? That's what it means to wrestle with your thoughts. And in verse 3, David prays, look on me and answer, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes. And so right there he's asking for God to help him understand when he says, give light to my eyes. Help clear this thing up for me, Lord. He's asking for God to help him understand why all these things are happening and why God has delayed in answering him. Have you ever been in a place where the answers aren't coming? And heaven remains silent and things aren't changing. It's during those days that we enter a time best described as a dark night of the soul. And listen, if you're uncomfortable with all of this, then let me remind you who David is, okay? he's First of all, he's an inspired writer of God's holy word. Secondly, remember that he's a man after God's own heart. He's an outstanding figure of faith, God chosen king of Israel and a key figure in the family history of Jesus Christ. But in spite of all of that, he didn't cover up the fact that he too went through those dark periods when things just didn't make any sense. Dark nights of the soul can come to anybody and to everybody at one time or another. That's why I like the Psalms of the Lament. That's why I don't skip over them because we can all identify with them because we've all been there and, and, and who knows, maybe you're there right now. But the most important thing is, is the way we handle those dark nights when they come. What are we going to do? How are we going to handle it? And that's where Psalm 13 can help us. And so very quickly, let me just mention a few things that can help you from this psalm. Notice that David kept praying anyway. Did you notice that? Psalm 13 is a prayer from the beginning to the end. And it's a prayer prayed by a man who's been praying and continuing to pray even though he felt like his prayers were going unanswered. You know, sometimes we don't, if we don't get a yes answer right away, then we think that our prayer hadn't been answered at all. But you see, sometimes God may say no. And I mean, we, I know we understand this. We know this. We've heard this before. But sometimes we need to be reminded of it. Sometimes God may, may say no, and that's his answer. At other times, he might say not now. But you see, those qualify as answers as well, don't they? They might not be the answers that we want. But listen, since when is God like Santa Claus and we just hand him our wish list and expect, us, expect him to, to give it to us? I mean, it doesn't work like that. It's just like it is with a parent, you know, a good parent, a loving parent. God knows better than his children what they truly need, just like you do with your own kids. And sometimes the timing isn't right, and so a child will need to <clears throat> wait, and you'll say, well, not now. You're not ready for that, son. At other times, you know, the answer might be no, and it will always be no. Uh, maybe instead of the uh, of the blessing that we think it is, whatever we're asking for might actually be harmful to us in a way that only God could know. And also remember that, listen, folks, God doesn't owe us an answer or an explanation for what he does and how he does things. He just asks us to trust him that he knows better. Remember, you know, Isaiah 46 and verse 10 says that God can see the end of a thing from the beginning. Now, we can't. But God can. God can see what the end result of this thing will be that we're talking about or praying about and asking for. And so, after all, you know, that's what faith is. Trusting God when things don't make sense. Faith is the evidence of things not yet seen. But having said all that, we're still supposed to ask. We're still supposed to pray. There may be blessings and answers that God is ready to give, but he's waiting on us to obey his command and ask. As James says, you have not because you ask not. 
Bottom line, folks, God answers prayer, but it just might not be the answer that you're looking for. Even though David was confused and even though he was hurt, he kept praying anyway. And you should too. Your prayer will be answered by a God who loves you and knows much more than we do what we really need. So that's number one. Here's something else that will help you. Try not to make assumptions about God. In times of crisis, pain, and confusion, it's easy to make false assumptions about God. Like when David said, will you forget me forever? Had God really forgotten about David? The one who he anointed king to replace Saul, the one that he would later call a man after his own heart. Was David really forgotten? No. He just felt that way. Be careful of those assumptions. Like Elijah assumed that he was the only one left be trying to be faithful to God. You know, was he right? No, he was dead wrong and God told him so. It's, it's like the man who was shipwrecked. And he was clinging to a piece of wood and finally washed up on a small island. And he, he built himself a little hut and he, he kindled a little fire so he could cook his food and stay warm. And every day while on that island, he would pray to the Lord to be rescued. And every day, no one came. And one day while he was out foraging for food, he returned only to find his hut in flames. And as he sat there and watched it burn, he began to lash out at God, wondering, uh, like David did, had God forgotten him? Why God had ignored all of his prayers for deliverance. And so he was angry with God and he was disappointed with God. And he sat down on the beach and he was ready to give up, just disgusted. And just then off in the distance, he saw a small ship headed his way. And when the captain welcomed him aboard, the rescued man said, I had almost given up hope that I would ever be rescued. And the captain said, well, we came because we saw your smoke signal. See, the man had assumed he had been forgotten and all of his prayers were unheard and unanswered. But how wrong he was. Be careful in making assumptions about God and what he's doing and why. Like when God reminded us in Isaiah 55 and verse 8, my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways. God is saying, I don't think like you think and I don't do things the way that you do things. Remember that and don't make assumptions about God. And then number three, be patient and learn to wait on the Lord. The next time you're going through a dark night of the soul, Wait on the Lord. You know, David kept asking, how long, how long? In fact, he asked that same question four times in six verses. How long? But folks, God's timing is always right. It's always right. But that doesn't mean it's not going to be hard for us. I mean, I think about Mary and Martha. You know, when their brother Lazarus was, was sick and dying. And they thought Jesus was late. Because when he finally showed up to their house, Lazarus was dead. Martha ran out to see him and, and said, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. That was true. But Jesus wasn't late. He was right on time. It was the perfect time for a great miracle when he raised her brother from the dead. God says, wait on me. But you know, waiting has always been hard, hasn't it? Life sometimes feels like waiting like, like waiting around in a hospital waiting room. And, and that's never easy. But still God says, wait. Wait on me. It's like the dad who took his four-year-old on a trip from Texas to Arizona. And if, of course, as kids will do, every few miles the kid would say, Dad, are we there yet? And the answer was always the same. No, son, we still got a long ways to go. And so after a few hours of this, the little boy finally asked, Dad, will I still be four years old when we get there? <laughs> and sometimes we may feel like that little fellow, you know. Waiting is hard, but God's timing is something of a mystery to us. But still, God asks us to wait. 
And listen, folks, there are some blessings that can only come when we do. And then finally, number four, trust God anyway. Trust him anyway. Look at verses five and six. After all of these things, you know, how long and where are you? or Why are you hiding from me? In verses five and six, listen to what David says. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, for he has been good to me. See, David thought back on all the times in his life that God had been there for him and blessed him. And so in this dark night of the soul, David says, I'm going to keep on trusting God because, as he put it, he's been good to me. There was a, a house on fire. And a father and his son had made their way up to the roof. And the dad jumped first so he could catch his boy when he jumped. But the kid was frozen in fear. He was petrified. He wouldn't move. And his dad kept was standing there in the yard and kept saying, Jump, son, jump. I'll catch you. I'll catch you. But the boy was just petrified. He wouldn't move a muscle. And with the smoke and the flames all around him, the little boy finally yelled, But dad, I can't see you. But his dad yelled back, but I can see you, son, and that's all that matters. And with that assurance, the boy jumped, and his dad caught him, and they were both saved. See, sometimes it may feel like your whole life is going up in flames. But just like David, trust God anyway. You might not be able to see him at the moment. You might not be able to feel that he's with you, but he is. Like David, you may be asking, where are you, Lord? But God says, I can see you. I can see you, my child. And that's all that matters, isn't it? And so in conclusion, whenever you encounter a dark night of the soul, I hope that you'll remember these things. I hope that you'll remember to pray anyway. I hope that you'll be careful about your assumptions that you make about God. I hope that you'll wait on him and that you'll trust him to see you through. And I don't know, maybe there's some things happening in your life right now that has brought you to the point of despair. And, and maybe you even feel abandoned by God. And I don't know what it could be. It could be the death of a loved one or a serious illness or a financial crisis or some problem with your marriage or with your kids and your family, your parents. Maybe it's a debilitating time of depression. Well, whatever it is, share your laments with God. Open up your heart and pour it out, no matter what it is. And, and, and like David, continue to seek his, his face in prayer and wait on him and trust him. Always remember that God, whose ways are unsearchable, is weaving your life into something beautiful, even though you may not be able to see it right now. Let's pray. Our dearest Father in heaven, we come to you now and Father, we thank you so much for placing this psalm within your scripture because there are times that, that we feel like David and we don't understand and maybe we cry out to you, Father, in our confusion and our pain and our hurt. We don't know where you are. We don't know what you're doing. But Father, help us to know that you always have a plan. Help us to just keep trusting in you anyway, to keep crying out and praying to you anyway and, and not make these false assumptions that you don't care because father we know that you do all we have to do is look at the cross to know how much you care so father those of us that are going through tough times right now i pray that that your presence will be with them that you'll help them through in jesus name we pray amen <music>